Hey, how are you, everybody? Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 231. Today, we're going to talk about self-defense, and we're going to talk about why it's important that all self-defense curriculums have movements that actually don't injure the attacker. Probably not the reason that you think I'm going to talk about. If you're new to the show, or you're coming back and maybe you suffered an aneurysm, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here on the show. I'm honored to talk to you today. Thanks for sharing your time with me. If you're new to everything we do at Whistlekick, check out whistlekick.com. That's the hub for all the stuff that we're doing online, whether it's this show or the products we sell or the courses we offer or Marshall Journal or the meme site or our social media. There's a lot. And you know how I know there's a lot? Because it takes a ton of my time and I'm not even the only one doing it. This is great. It's amazing when I think back how Whistlekick has grown. I'm not going to go down that road right now, though. Today, we're going to talk about self-defense. There are a lot of topics within the whole concept of self-defense, things that we could talk about that would get a lot of views. I could say, these are the top five martial arts self-defense movements. And I have no idea why I just did that voice. But we could put that out and it would get a ton of views, a ton of listens, and a lot of criticism. And that seems to be a lot of what's out there for content around self-defense. We could do stuff on how most traditional martial arts aren't applicable in self-defense, and we'd, we'd get a bunch of people looking at it, listening to it, and some of them would be really, really critical to say, no, traditional martial arts works, and we get some others saying, no, it doesn't, and, and supporting what we said. I'm not talking about either of those things. In fact, I don't want to talk about either of those things. Those topics have been done to death. <laughs> they bore me. And to be honest, to assert either of those positions, to say these are the best self-defense movements, eh, it's kind of arrogant. I don't do arrogant. I share. That's kind of my mindset. I've always been passionate about self-defense, about sharing self-defense concepts with people, both in and out of the martial arts. Over the last year or so, I've been involved with a group teaching women self-defense, but in a very different way. And I'm not going to go into that. Uh, it's actually a, a past guest on the show who runs this company, and, and I've been fortunate to get involved and volunteer my time. And I've learned a lot. And one of the things I've learned is that the martial arts concepts that we teach as self-defense are really hard for a lot of people to wrap their brain around. Because a lot of people struggle with violence. The idea of defending yourself before it's too late requires, the way most of us have approached it historically, escalating the violence. If someone comes up to you and grabs your wrist, what's the number one thing that tends to be taught in most martial arts schools? It's getting out of that wrist lock and maybe manipulating the hand, the wrist in a way. Or maybe it's a kick to the groin or a poke to the eyes. Well, in all of those cases, we as the defender have had to escalate the violence. We've had to not meet people where they are at, but go beyond. And you know what? That's a concept that most people struggle with. Because the messaging from being from birth is you don't hit people, you don't hurt people. Sometimes we get you don't hurt someone unless they're trying to hurt you. And that's been instilled over years. And it takes a really long time to get past that or to even just reconcile it, which is part of the reason so many martial artists seem to struggle when more realistic situations, anxiety-driven situations come up. We've done episodes on anxiety and how to train under that load because it is a load. It completely changes everything that happens. And I'll link to that in the show notes today. And while people are anxious and they're stressed and on some level they're trying to consider how they're going to do what they're doing 
without hurting people, they can hurt themselves. It goes from the wrist lock to being on the ground. It goes to a point that's so much harder to handle. We don't talk about that too much. I'm sure there are some schools out there that do, and I applaud you. I've been part of nearly a dozen schools during my life. And I've heard this topic come up a couple times, but not at length. We've always spent our time working on what in, in, in that school's curriculum was considered effective, safe, easy movements. I'm going to share with you a few of my favorite movements, and this isn't turning into the top five self-defense movements or, or even the top five self-defense movements that won't injure people. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm going to share some with you as examples because I'm sure you have others. And that's great. And the key is that those movements are actually pretty easy to apply. They're simple, easy to teach. And most importantly, people can practice them on others and know that, you know what, it's not going to hurt. I'm going to start with my first one. The first one actually comes from my Taekwondo instructor. This is probably his favorite movement. I love it. And it's pinching the inside of someone's thigh. It really doesn't get easier than that. If you're in a position to, to reach there and you pinch, it's generally going to startle someone. They're probably going to release. It will allow you to maybe get away or push someone away. It can even be linked into more physical attacks, but that's not why I'm sharing that. We've all been startled by something like this, you know, a, a, jab, a poke in the back or someone coming up from behind and kind of tickling your armpit. That startle response, uh, people tend to let go. It tends to take them out of where they're at and it doesn't hurt anyone. My favorite one, is applying slow, even gentle pressure up under the nose. And you may have heard my voice just change because I did it for some reason. <laughs> it is almost impossible for people to resist that. And if someone's nose is pulled up, their head is back, they're not looking at you, they're looking up, and that will take a lot of the fight out of a person. If the attacker's facing you, the idea of pushing your couple fingers into their throat. Again, I did it. You may have just heard my voice change. I don't, this is what I do. This is what I do. When I'm recording episodes, my feet move around. I have a hard time sitting still. I'm moving around. I'm acting out the things that I'm talking about. Usually you can't hear it, but here we go. I'm grabbing my own nose and poking my own throat. To put a couple fingers into somebody's throat and just push, that's such a sensitive area. It's such a personally protected area. We, we don't like people doing that. That will generally elicit a response. And there are more. You can do weird things. You can do silly things. Sometimes in the way self-defense is instructed, especially to non-martial artists, you've got to do something that they'll easily remember. Well, what's more memorable than giving somebody a wet willy? Is that going to stop someone from really trying to kill you? Absolutely not. But it's going to make the attacker pause in a lot of cases. I'm certainly not an expert in human psychology. Again, I want to roll you back a couple minutes ago. I'm sharing these examples as examples of a concept, not to say that these are the best things, but I know you have some in your curriculum and I want you to consider them and their importance. If someone comes at you with violence and you lick your finger and put it in their ear, they will pause. They will wonder, what is going on? And maybe that gives you the opportunity to pinch inside their thigh. Maybe it gives you the opportunity to pull up on their nose. Why are these non-injurious movements so important? Two reasons. We already talked about the first one. Because people have a hard time escalating violence. 
Good people do, anyway. Secondly, because sometimes you're attacked by someone that you don't actually want to hurt. What happens when your best friend has a bad day and they're at your house and they get drunk? Or you're at a bar and someone that you know casually gets drunk and they're trying to hurt you? Or at least they engage in a situation where you think they might try to hurt you, or they might hurt you accidentally. Yes, there are probably some of you out there listening saying, well, you know what, you just, you do what you got to do and you, you sort it out later. Sure, that is an option. And maybe that works for you, but that may not work for everyone. For a lot of us, it's hard to harm someone that we know that we care about, maybe even love. Generating options, training options that don't hurt people, that can be deployed quickly. It's important to practice them. It's important to make them part of your self-defense curriculum, whether you teach that in a school or you teach that to strangers on the street. Everyone loves the satisfying feel of kneeing a, a bag or a pad or a padded up person in the groin, in the belly. It feels good. But it's a lot harder to do that when people might actually get hurt. I'd love to know your thoughts. What movements that don't harm attackers do you have in your self-defense curriculum? Let me know. Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. We are at Whistlekick on social media. And you can find the show notes for this and every other episode. And comment there. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com Hope to hear from you. Remember, this is episode 231. And maybe you can share this with some friends of yours that don't listen to the show yet. We're growing. We continue to grow. It's so cool. Thanks for helping with that. Until next time, train hard, smile, 